When it comes to Pacific Trade, this seems like it's fourth quarter, full court press yeah. from you and your administration. It, it's the right thing to do for the American economy and the American people. Um, and certainly the right thing to do for Seattle and, and the state of Washington. Texas is going to benefit and all of us are going to benefit. And when it comes to innovation, California is our capital. These are the, going to be the huge markets of the future. Look at those faces right there, the faces of reporters and anchors saying, President, we're not buying it. President Obama has used this tactic before going to local news stations in the markets where he wants to have some influence and wants to use that bully pulpit to lean on local representatives and try and get their support. Is that how you interpret it? Well, that's pretty much a fact. That's what they call it okay. live from the White House now. And this, in, uh, these invites and interviews with local stations, this goes all the way back to the time when it, Mr. Obama was candidate. Obama, that's a great place to start a roundtable. And please welcome to our roundtable senior political contributor for Forbes.com and co-host of The Daily Wrap right here on Newsmax, Rick Unger. Also, Newsmax contributor Kevin Broderick. Thank you both for joining us here on this Friday. Great to be here. Rick, when you watch these live at the White House interviews, and I don't know if you did this or not, but I did one of these a long time ago when it was candidate Obama, and they want to keep these very controlled, and they think they can do a better job of controlling these local media outlets. But there is so much doubt right now about the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, and then the TPA, which is the fast-track authority for the president, that a lot of these local anchors weren't buying what the president had to say. And it looks like this could be a serious issue for the president trying to get support from these local markets. Is he failing at this? Well, you know, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen, John. By the way, happy Friday, guys. Yes, happy always uh, happy Friday. You know, I, it, it's, it's, like, it's like somebody trying to sell me a car, but absolutely refusing to show me what the car looks like. I don't know if I'm for this or against this because I haven't been able to read this. So there's this big push going on to say, oh, this is great, oh, this, and then you have the other side going, the Democrats in this, in this case, going, no, this is terrible. I don't know what it is. I have some concerns. I'm concerned about what it might do to American workers, but I can't tell you if I'm ultimately concerned because nobody will let me read the agreement. That is the biggest hmm. issue right here is the secrecy surrounding all this. Kevin, you, yeah. you know, you, a lot of Americans, you know, they're not going to take the time to pick up a trade agreement and even be able to decipher what's in it, especially when you're looking at an international agreement. Do you think this is a failure, again, from the White House to try and sell this or perhaps just the American people saying enough is enough? Well, there's a huge lack of transparency going on. And, you know, getting back to what Rick was saying, you know, the proof's in the pudding, and we don't know what the pudding is. And this president seems to be really, really great at having these large conjecture type statements of, don't worry, Silicon Valley's going to do great, and the farmers are going to do great, and everyone's going to do great. Except, you know, you go back to NAFTA and the free trade agreement since then, a lot of the president's constituencies, which is largely union based, uh, have not benefited from those free trade agreements. Right. And, you know, you're running into Guys, those we issues. Go ahead, Rick. We should be a little bit we should be a little bit fair here. You know, it's not at all uncommon to not know what's in a trade agreement until it's completed, or for that matter, any agreement in both private or public sector. So I'm not that upset that we haven't seen it yet. What I'm upset about is that people are trying to convince us to be for it or not be for it. It's not completed. We do have to have a chance to read it. Look, you're right. The American public is not going to sit down and read this agreement. But you know what? Guys like Kevin, guys like me who do this for a living, we are are going to read it and people look to all of us to give us an opinion either for or against but rick i and do think it's very telling what, opinion. What, what kevin is saying is very true though and you look at like these you know the northeast the, the rust belt corridor a lot of where these with the, the base of american manufacturing the local right. representatives the, especially the democrats mm -hmm. in these areas they do not support this and i think that that's might what be i think is right. telling. most telling of all At Absolutely right. Absolutely right. But again, they haven't read it either. I get their concerns and I share their concerns. But until we see it, and that goes for the union leaders too, I've talked to them. I said, do you guys know something I don't know? And they basically go, not really. So right. none of us really know. We may read it and hate it, but we haven't read it yet. I think a lot of the issues that are stemming out of the agreement are that with those Rust Belt workers and with those people that have not benefited from these free trade agreements in the past, um, you know, what are they going to take away from this? How is this possibly going to benefit them? I'm a free market conservative and I like free markets and I like American products being sold in free markets. But at the end of the day, those constituencies and those Congress people that are out there trying to get reelected in 2016, uh, Obama's, uh, you know, 
basically saying to them, look, we'll help you out. We're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you in the primary. That's not gonna help them if they won by 1% in 2014 going into 2016. They need those constituencies. They need those union groups and they need yeah. to, to put, make those assurances that this agreement is gonna work for them. You've got a lame duck president. You've got, he's underwater on approval ratings and you're looking at a situation where you know he hasn't necessarily negotiated well in the past going back to the uh, health care bill with the pharmaceutical companies being done behind closed doors then you've got to you dovetail that into the Bo Bergdahl deal which is blown up in his face and now you have the UN nuke deal which is widely panned so there's a lot of different things we need to look at here and uh, you know there's reason to be very skeptical when President Obama gives people assurances All right, All right. we'll pick it up guys mm -hmm. on the other side of this commercial break we got to step aside pay some bills we'll be back on the other side And welcome back for part two of our roundtable. Joining us once again, senior political contributor for Forbes.com and co-host of The Daily Wrap, Rick Unger, and Newsmax contributor, Kevin Broadwick. Thanks for staying with us. All right, guys, we're going to pick up our conversation. We're mm -hmm. talking about these two issues here, which involve trade, the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. Folks have heard of TPP. But of course, there's also TPA, which is the president's fast-track authority, which allows him to negotiate certain trade deals with foreign countries. But a big part of this discussion, and we look at the secrecy involved here, is that the president would then be required to disclose the details of those trade deals in Congress, would in effect get an up or down vote. So, you know, again, to your point, Rick, about being fair here, but what I think is very hard for a lot of folks to digest is the fact that you have President Obama and very conservative Republicans on the same side of this issue, right. Rick. Right, although it's interesting, Kevin really isn't taking the more conservative tack on this, which I appreciate, and I'm really not necessarily taking the more democratic tack. So I think what you find out here is that people who are trying to be honest brokers in this are basically telling the truth and saying, I don't know. So yeah, I mean, I'm not that upset about the up or down vote. I think that's actually preferable in almost every piece of legislation, but I am very concerned that people like us who do read these things and comment on these things mm -hmm. have the opportunity to do that before that up or down vote takes place. Yeah. All right. Well, we want to move on. We don't want to get too much into the weeds here, but we do want to. This is very important stuff. And, you know, right. Democrats are pointing out the fact that uh, this is a globalization thing and the American working class has not done very well under ag agreements like NAFTA in the past. But moving on now, The New York Times right. is reporting that the NSA is secretly expanding Internet spying at the U.S. border, according to classified NSA documents, which apparently have been leaked, the administration expanded surveillance of American interna international internet traffic to search for computer hacking. Now, when we look at what happened mm -hmm. with China, this makes sense. But, Kevin, the USA Freedom Act did not limit spying on malicious hackers. This is probably a necessary thing. Would you say that? Absolutely. I mean, look, the 21st century, the biggest threat to our country <laughs> is going to be cybersecurity. And we need absolutely every tool in our quiver to fight that. And if that means that we need to follow these people abroad and follow down these IP addresses to the foreign governments and anything linked to them, I'm all about that. If the hackers are on U.S. soil, they need a warrantless wiretap, that's fine by me because these are different times. You know, and, and there's a lot of libertarians out there that are fighting that Rand Paul uh, you know, uh, line of argument that, well, everyone needs their, their personal freedoms. Well. Everyone gives up their personal freedoms every day. You go and you go onto iTunes, you're clicking a I agree and you're giving away those freedoms. You ride on an airplane, you're being patted down. Those freedoms are being given away. But it's, it's, it's in a sense of security and we need to keep our country safe. Cybersecurity is a number one going forward. Mm -hmm. Anybody with internet access can cause a lot of harm if they're trained properly. And tracking these people down and taking the offense to them is a very, very important thing. Rick, your thoughts? Uh, a couple of things. First of all, I, I don't think it's an accident that we found out about that program within 24 hours of finding out that four million government employees have been hacked. <laughs> uh, I think that was on purpose. I, you know, I, in terms of the issue itself, you have to go back to the same test that you always go to, which is the balancing act. You have to balance, you know, the importance of of being able to track people like that with personal freedoms. It's an ongoing balancing act, always going to be difficult, even with the best of intentions. 
What I do worry about is that we'll get sidetracked in that discussion and we'll miss the point of the only thing the United States really can do about this hacking. No matter what we do technologically, the hackers always seem to manage to be a step ahead either already or in the very near future. The only way we get this under control is that if China does something like this to us, we do something like this back to them plus 10%. It's an arms race. I agree with Kevin, this is the warfare of the future and you have to approach it that way. Just installing systems isn't going to get it done. If they do it to us, we do it back to them and a little bit worse and eventually you get to a mutual assured uh, destruction and people start not doing it. Right, because sometimes it's, it's hard to tell right away who's actually behind something. I mean, you can mask uh, it. No, apparently true, not. But we, we can do that. Yeah, apparently not. They, this, yeah. they, they implicated no, China saying, right away. Right, but they're saying that it's very difficult. A lot of times the, the law was kind of written so you would have to know that this is coming from a foreign country. And what a lot of these officials are saying is we don't always know right away. I don't believe it. It took us no time to figure out North Korea was behind the Sony attack. We right. know it's the Chinese. It's, it's not that hard. It's what we do. But now look, and, and in the interest of keeping perspective on this, for all we know, this Chinese attack on our government computers might have been a retaliation for something that we did to them. Very true. In right. making this kind of a point, we don't know everything about it. We'll see if this generates any discussion again about a cybersecurity bill, which Congress has failed to uh, really do. Uh, you know. We're very behind, let's put it that I way. I mean, there's just too much going on. And getting back to what Miranda was saying, uh, Kevin, we've got anybody, about 20 seconds left just to let you know. Sure. Uh, anybody that has internet access and you can buy a dump phone anytime you want and, you know, you can cause a lot of trouble. You can go into a public library and that's not traceable. You can log right. into the internet. As there. you mentioned, Kevin, it's an entirely new world out there with these cyber yep. threats and uh, a good warning about what happened with China just recently. A good defense is. is a good offense. That's fair enough, John. Kevin Broderick, Rick Unger, Thank thanks you. so much for being with us.